Welcome back everyone for this panel discussion which opens the space to talk about pushbacks at the Croatian Bosnian border and beyond and to reflect a little bit about the play Invisible Game that we just watched which examines the structures and people who perpetrate border violence and the play is based on documented pushback cases. It shows a lot of original footage from the border, sounds from the border. It uses the original statements from politicians at national and European level in order to illuminate the different aspects of violence and oppression at the border. So one aspect is what happens at the Croatian Bosnian border itself, like the initial scene with the destruction of mobile phones during pushbacks. But then there's also the money that flows from the European Union and the support from Germany, and behind that, long standing structures of colonialism and racism. And at the same time, the play also alludes to forms of intervention. So we hear about the ombudswoman and the activists, the relentless activists and journalists who document border violence. So we have a lot to talk about in this panel and um, we'll give our best, although it's a little bit late. Um, I am Vera Fried, I am a PhD researcher in Berlin, writing about extortions amongst other issues and uh, with generous support from the Heinrich Böll Foundation who are also who also partially funded this play and the discussion tonight, so thanks for that. And I am very happy to be here with four people who know a lot about pushback and can also talk about different forms of intervention against it. So first to my left is Nicole Vögele, who is a journalist and filmmaker whose work has contributed a lot to unmasking pushbacks at many European borders. And in particular, she led the Lighthouse Reports investigation group who worked for years to get documentations of the pushbacks at the Croatian-Bosnian border. And um, for those of you who don't know the website yet, uh, you should look up Unmasking Europe's Shadow Armies because it has uh, the original footage, some of which that we have seen in the play and also links to all the news outlets that took it up to report about it. So that was very important. And next, Carsten Dierike, who is a lawyer and constitutional judge in Hamburg and also since 2013 works with the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights in Berlin, which is an NGO that uses legal means in order to intervene against human rights violations and the migration program, and Carsten in particular, represent, support and represent people on the move who submit complaints against pushbacks, for instance, to the European Court of Human Rights and UN Treaty Bodies. And next, uh, Mohamed Al-Kasha, who is a human rights lawyer, activist, and researcher. He is also part of the Watch the Met Alarm Phone, who document and intervene against pushbacks in the Mediterranean Sea. And last but not least, Erik Markert, who is a member of the European Parliament since 2013 for the Greens, European for the Greens, and um, also the shadow rapporteur on Croatia's Schengen accession, which we will talk about later. However, Erik was already involved in documenting border violence as a photojournalist before becoming a member of the European Parliament and also published a book called Europa schafft sich ab, which I think translates into something roughly like Europe is abolishing itself, that I also recommend to you. Um, so as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, this pushback is based on original footage, and this footage is actually quite hard to get because obviously states have an interest in obstructing the documentation of pushbacks and collection of evidence. And so my first question would be to you, Nicole, to tell us a little bit more about how you tried to document pushbacks at the Croatian-Bosnian border, and maybe also what it's like to now see it in a theater play. Thanks for the nice introduction. 
So where to start? I, I will maybe give like two sentences roughly of, of what I've been working on that uh, uh, for those who uh, did not, not follow these stories like very closely. So I came to Bosnia uh, in winter 2018 as you know someone who was supporting friends who were supporting people on the move who got stuck in Bosnia. Winters are hard in these countries and they're the, like uh, great NGOs doing very important work. And um, being there, uh, talking to, I guess, over some months to hundreds of people, uh, you know, uh, telling what is happening to them at the borders. Like, I mean, I think the strongest or like the, the shock, most shocking case we had is a guy that came back with really a, a broken uh, uh, head. Like, really, uh, we had to bring him immediately to, to uh, emergency. And, you know, people without teeth, uh, like, and broken arms many times, and you're like, <laughs> what the fuck is going on up there? We were in Sarajevo, which is, like, some, uh, quite some kilometers away from the, from the actual border. And there were already um, um, NGOs documenting, like, the border violence, monitoring networking, that was just about to settle up. But the thing was that, and it was in media, there, were, there have, have been quite good, good reports, but... Oh, as soon as you went up on higher levels in uh, in politics, there was like, yeah, they're all telling lies. They're beating <coughs> each other up. It's always these Afghans go against the Algerians. They have racism amongst them. But, you know, this whole it, it goes to the extremes that they say like, yeah, they have a place where they had cherry juice to put it on their back to then uh, look like as if they were beaten up and. You know, when you've been a, a journalist for like twenty years or back then maybe fifteen years, you're like. Uh, it's happening so so often, like so regularly. This must be we have to, we have to take a video of it. Like, and um, there was one attempt to take videos before that was uh, done with uh, hidden cameras. And there you then have a bit the problem that you cannot prove where it was, when it was, who was involved. So um, yeah, this, so I called my boss. I was back then working at the Swiss National Television for a, a background and I was like, okay, I, I need to go to the forest now. I need a thermal camera and I need this and this, and we just have to film it. And uh, the thing that we thought is done in one day, or you know, I was just imagining, I, I go there and sit behind a tree and you know, put up a tripod. It took us three weeks to get one image in the end, or let's say one one uh, one film where you see an actual pushback. And um, yeah, to make the long story short, that was a non-violent pushback. Then it was like, yeah, yeah, we just helped them. They got lost in the minefield, and then we brought them back. Like, like all these these things that you just experienced in the play is, I mean, I always just saw the media, the reactions that they gave to our media uh, publications. But you can you can exactly imagine how it is how it is happening behind closed doors. So yeah, we, we stayed on the topic. Then a year later, this phone video that is the center of this. Um, of this play uh, started to circle in Facebook and a friend of mine and I we took like six months to investigate it down because we first had to figure out what where it is who is in the video like nothing was clear it was just someone randomly uploaded it and, and where it is and then it we figured out that it's as if it were a sign that is taken at the house of these old people that were friends of mine that um, more or less are maybe one of the bases for, for this old couple that, uh, or elderly couple that is also in the play. So we were able to track that down and publish then the video with the original footage, with interviews of the, the person crying in the video, with even with uh, Slovenian authority papers proving that they handed over these people to Croatia. And then um, still you cannot really see how they are using force and, and and yeah, and then we gathered like together, which we go with like those reports with uh, with other uh, journalists. We gathered as much force as possible, and it took us. I don't, I, don't, I really I calculated it. I think I spent in in three years. I spent more six months in 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 these forests, like in trying everything. We were putting up hunter cameras. We were putting up GoPros. We were flying drones. We were using these tele lenses and hiding. And I don't know how many cameras we lost because they found them uh, a lot. Uh, I don't know, I think it was three times when we had to run away because they were waiting for us in bushes. Um, and um, yeah, so it, was, it, it, it became like a, a nerdy story of, of me really wanting uh, them on, on tape, how they are really doing these violent pushbacks where you can see them in masks, where you can really 
disguise the union, like like you can recognize the uniform because that was not able in, in the phone video. There they really did this thing like yeah, these were maybe four clowns that were dressing up and uh, and, and uh, th this was really the narrative that they were trying to to spread in the media. So um, yeah, I mean we, yeah we became quite creative. We uh, we took. Uh, we um, took close. We closed it as like fishermen, and <laughs> because they were expecting us after a certain time, so we sort of had to fit in into this remote border area. Uh, as soon as they see, let's say, some individuals that do not belong there, they they get alarmed. And you could even see on some on some footage that when they come out before the pushback with their how they with their binoculars, you can really see how they're checking the area. So it was like, <laughs> we're here. <laughs> so um, yeah. Uh, so this it, this is what we've done uh, extensively the last years, and finally had the big publication uh, out that that you mentioned last. It's now a year ago, and I think um, it it helped a bit changing the situation. The violence, I, I have to say, the violence went down. They are much more scared in being caught on um, video footage. Uh, I spoke to a lot of migrants this summer in, in the area. So, um, but st yeah, still it's happening on, on a daily basis. I spent this September in, uh, in one border village and sometimes every day I saw 50 people uh, coming out of the woods not knowing where they are uh, without anything in their pockets. Um, so seeing that this is happening every day, although it's so extremely cautious and going to that against all the laws that we know and that we're based on, like that, um, is is a helpful. Uh, it's yeah, it's really difficult to to even describe it. And um, yeah, to come back to the play, maybe I, I just said to you when we were outside. For me, it's like I handed out. Or is, am I allowed to? <laughs> to <laughs> So uh, yeah, I collected a lot of material throughout these four years, not only talking to um, to Croatian policemen who uh, were uh, willing to speak to me uh, in secret, but also to local Bosnian people who experience this every day. And I handed over all my material that I had gathered to the to directors of this play, and, and so I, I yeah I recognized a lot of things, and I guess it's still very close to me. I know this Bosnian couple that somehow um, experienced this and I've been with them in some nights and um, for me it's, uh, it was uh, wonderful when Matja and David called me and asked me this and I, I said immediately I'm really happy to share because when you do journalistic work you can often just pick like four sentences and then you have these 20 pages, I mean one, one interview was maybe 100 pages of talks and it's really nice that something can grow out of it. Um, yeah, and maybe uh, what was really funny is I was with the, this funny interview with the Croatian president back then. I was really present, and she really acted like this. That <laughs> maybe I, I was really there, and it was like, and after the interview, she was like, <laughs> 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 like it's, 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 it's no trouble. So yeah, I think that's uh, how far I can go now, and then I'm really happy to answer questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think that really uh, illustrated how close the play is to the, to the reality, like the pushbacks themselves, but then also the solidarity on the Bosnian side, the absurd excuses, and uh, the little bit of force that is needed to do pushbacks. And, uh, well, another aspect that we heard a lot about in the play is the Schengen zone. It came up repeatedly in the singing slogans in between, and then also the, article, uh, the reference to Article 13 of the Schengen Border Code as a justification that borders need to be protected and therefore pushbacks need to be perpetrated. And um, Schengen is the uh, zone of freedom of movement within member states and goes hand in hand with stronger border enforcement at the external borders of the Schengen Zone. And yesterday, actually, the European Parliament passed a decision endorsing that Croatia can become a full member of the Schengen Zone. So uh, actually, the play needs to be updated because I think it's still set soon to become. 
And so my next question would be to you, Eric, uh, to share a little bit about uh, the debates and the decisions on decision decisions on Croatia's succession to the Schengen zone and what that means, what that has to do with pushbacks, etc. Yeah, okay, it's a, like a very complicated procedure when it comes to the Schengen accession, not only of Croatia, but also for Romania and Bulgaria, which are somehow connected at the moment. Um, um, the discussion is, I think, like now for 11 years. So for 11 years, uh, Romania, Bulgaria and Croatia try to be part of the Schengen area. And what is a little bit sad is that um, there was a big discussion in the Council, so the member states of the European Union, um, preventing um, the accession of Schengen of Croatia, Romania, Bulgaria for now 11 years, as I said. Um, and that's not because of some kind of pushbacks, but more for kind of racist views and people fearing people from Eastern Europe coming to the Netherlands or whatever. And that, um, yeah, <laughs> like, uh, yeah it's, it's that situation. Um, and then actually um, they did not say, okay, we are racist, we don't want you in Schengen because you look weird or whatever. They basically said um, something like, yeah, no, you have to protect your borders uh, first. <laughs> and that's um, a little bit weirder when you know that to um, have access to the Schengen area has some um, um, conditions, for example, the condition to fulfill every article of the Schengen Borders Code, not only Article 13, but also Article 4, because it's uh, about fundamental rights. Uh, but um, the discussion of Croatia was basically that everybody was telling Croatia um, when they acted in line, or not everyone, but w when there were no systematic pushbacks, um, okay, you have to protect your borders to be in line with the Schengen Borders Code, but basically they started to act against the Schengen Borders Code when it comes to fundamental rights and all the asylum laws. And then, in 2019, the Commission did an assessment and said, okay, now everything is fine. Like when they started the systematic pushbacks. Um, it's a very interesting report, if you like this kind of reports, and uh, I don't know, like, you can read the report of the Commission in 2019, and especially the fundamental rights aspects, because they basically said, um, that Croatia acts in line with the Schengen Borders Code because they promised that they will um, have an independent monitoring mechanism which will prove that in the end uh, everything is in line with the law somehow. So they basically said, okay, they are like, violating the laws, but they said they do something about it and then everything will be fine in the future, but let's say now that it will be fine in the future, which says uh, no problem at all. And um, th that was pretty weird. And then they uh, created an independent monitoring mechanism, which was not independent at all. Um, actually, the NGOs who were involved said that it's not independent and that they have no access to the um, green border, that they have actually also, like, they had to say when they come to a police station, then they could come to a police station, and then the police officer said basically, oh, everything is fine here, then they asked, okay, can we maybe see some documents, and they said, oh yeah, you can try, like there's a password on the computer, I don't know the password, but you can try. And um, that was basically the independent monitoring mechanism of Croatia. And um, what happened now in the European Parliament was a little bit, um, that's why I started with Romania, Bulgaria, and Croatia, a little bit weird also, because actually the SFD, so Social Democrats and Liberals, were in favor of Romania and Bulgaria, and uh, EPP, so the Conservatives, were in favor of Croatia, because they had government there. And then they discussed with, with each other, I was not present in the discussion, because I'm in another group, and they said, okay, let's make a deal. Like, um, let's not talk so much about the problems, let's talk about um, how we can be in favor of the Schengen accession of Romania, Bulgaria, and Croatia, we have a majority, and let's vote down most of the amendments um, focusing on um, human rights somehow. Um, that was a little bit complicated for us because we actually, like, in general, we are not against as, as Greens or I think also as a like, left part of the parliament. Um, we are not against the Schengen enlargement. Basically, good idea to enlarge the Schengen area until it is enlarged over the whole world somehow. <laughs> yeah. um, but in general, of course, we had some um, concerns regarding the fundamental rights situation and what we did is to have a report now of the European Parliament with, which is somehow um, presenting some conditions for the Schengen accession of Croatia, um, namely 
a really independent um, human rights monitoring mechanism. There are also some signs, there was some work in the background, also by the German government, but also by the Commission, the part of the Commission who is not completely stupid, um, and uh, some others, to um, really force them to invent an independent monitoring mechanism. Um, then there are some reporting conditions and some other stuff in the report which is somehow okay if it's in the end fulfilled. What you have to know, to speak not so long, but I already did, sorry, um, is um, that basically what makes it a little bit complicated to discuss these topics also in the European Parliament is for example that if um, you have the first meeting with all the shadow rapporteurs and the rapporteurs, so everybody like knows one person a group and then you discuss these files. Um, the first meeting the rapporteur Rangel from EPP told us that there are no pushbacks and everybody was telling you that there are pushbacks, it's like a conspiracy theorist and maybe there are two or three pushbacks but they will solve it but there are no problems at all and everybody was telling something else is uh, stupid. Yeah? Um, and that's a kind of discussion that's the biggest group in the European Parliament just saying there not existing, and um, what I when I came into politics in 2019, not 13, um, in the European Parliament, um, I had the like I had the idea that if there is a huge scandal, that it has consequences, but actually that's not the case. So the majority has to understand that the scandal is a scandal, otherwise they just say, well, no, like <laughs> let's do something else now, like not talk about this shit. It's a conspiracy theory that makes it a little bit complicated, also because. Um, the European Union is somehow based on the idea that democracies who are part of the European Union are able to solve challenges with like at least looking in their laws and respecting the rule of law somehow. So all the mechanisms um, which the European Union has are somehow based on the idea that um, if somebody commits a crime in a member state, the member state will solve it, and that leads to the, in the end, the situation we have at the moment. That if you ask the European Commission, are there some like problems at the border in Croatia? They say, we don't know. It's not our task to be there. We ask Frontex. Frontex, they have an idea, okay, and then Frontex saying, yeah, but it's not our job to like just judge on member states of the European Union. We are an agency, so. But we will investigate, and they asked, for example, the Croatian border police and the Croatian government if there is a problem at the border. Then the Croatian border police and the government is saying, no problem at all here. Like everybody, everything is in line with the international law. And then Frontex say, oh, cool, thank you for, for checking that. Um, and then Frontex is saying to the European Commission, yeah, we checked everything, no problem at all. And the Commission is saying, yeah, we checked everything, no problem at all. And if you come to the Croatian um, border police and government, they say, yeah, basically, um, it's, it's not about us to check that, but the UP Commission and Frontex said, no problem at all. So that's how it works at the moment, and that makes it a little bit complicated. Sorry for speaking so long, but now I said everything I wanted to say. Nothing to <laughs> Well, thanks for the explanation. I mean, it is complicated, so it needs explanation. And uh, you already mentioned fundamental rights, which brings us to uh, Karsten and the role of fundamental rights at the border. So pushbacks violate a number of principles in international human rights and refugee law, such as the principle of non refoulement and the prohibition of collective expulsion, amongst others. And uh, so my question to you, Karsten, would be to explain a little bit more about the possibilities of legal accountability at the border in front of, for instance, the European Court of Human Rights and UN committees focusing on Croatia and beyond. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Vera. Um, yeah, we, we started working on the situation at European borders in 2013. Uh, we, this is uh, the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights and, and myself. And at that point of time, the starting point at that uh, time was a, a kind of analysis of the situation in different parts um, of the European Union, Central Met, the situation in Spain and the Canary Islands, and of course the 
uh, situation in the Aegean Sea and the Turkish um, Greek land border at that time. And uh, one of the key findings that still has, has uh, is actual in these days was that um, there was a lot of knowledge about what is going on, about pushbacks uh, at, uh, at European borders. I remember a report from Coazul published 2013, 2014 called Pushback, maybe one of the first uh, uh, reports that used that term that we are so familiar with today, uh, which included, I don't know, some uh, nearly 100 interviews with uh, refugees at the Turkish-Greek land border at the River Ebros. So this was the situation at that time, and similar um, reports existed, for example, on the situation in Spain uh, at the Spanish-Moroccan uh, uh, land border. But there was not a single case uh, that uh, addressed these violence uh, and these thousands of pushbacks that, that NGOs and journalists reported about. It. And this was striking, and in a way, this is still striking because now, 22, there are still only very, very few cases that address what we saw today in, in, this, in this play and that everybody who wants to know what is going on can know. And of course, these are extreme, um, severe crimes that were committed. And of course, this what what we saw in the play and what Nicole um, uh, covered in, in her, in her uh, footage is of course uh, illegal, yeah? so uh, there's, there's no doubt. But uh, the interesting thing is that there are very, very few cases by national courts or by European courts or uh, UN institutions that address this. And this, oh, there are many reasons. Uh, Vera mentioned some of them, some of them we saw in the play. Uh, the destruction of potential evidence by, uh, by plundering the people, by stealing their mobile phones or destroying them, uh, by the, um, not registering the people in, 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 at first place. So you have, they don't, nobody has the possibility to prove that she or he uh, was in Croatia intercepted by Croatian uh, um, uh, policemen before returned or uh, falsely returned to Bosnia. So it's a very difficult situation, and last but not least, uh, the um, uh, fact that the, there's a lot of brutal violence, people are highly traumatized through these experiences they went through, and not one time, not two time, we are, we know um, um, people on the move who faced such situations uh, 20 to 30 times until they then, uh, or, Many of them finally managed to pass through Croatia and are now living among us with these highly uh, uh, yeah, broken souls in a way. Yeah? So uh, highly traumatized from not necessarily from, from what they faced in their country of origin, but what they faced at our uh, European border. So this was uh, the starting point of, of our work and this is still what, what uh, drives us what, what, um, to, to move forward. And uh, there are, um, to keep it short, there are some, some cases now pending uh, in front of the European Court of Human Rights uh, that, that uh, we were able to uh, bring up, uh, on behalf of uh, Syrian refugees who went through this uh, um, game, as, as people would call it, this uh, uh, torturous um, uh, um, practices in Croatia. But uh, we also were able to bring cases to the UN um, Human Rights Committee, to the uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child for a young uh, Rohingya minor who uh, also uh, was uh, intercepted several times, heavily uh, beaten, uh, had to uh, walk only barefoot in the winter, and so on. So uh, extreme uh, forms of violence, and just today, uh, uh, we were happy to, after a long uh, um, prep preparation, to file um, the, a case on behalf of Ibrahim, as you would call him in uh, your um, footage, uh, whom we briefly saw in the play, uh, uh, the young Pakistani man who was heavily mistreated and then uh, with the whip, uh, together with uh, other groups, uh, members of his travel group, forced uh, beaten back to
to Bosnia and uh, you saw how, how heavily he is injured. He is still heavily traumatized um, uh, and uh, but decided to uh, not let it go. Uh, doesn't accept that there is still, until now, we can speak about this more in more detail, no accountability, um, the procedures or the, the, the investigation, the disciplinary investigation that uh, uh, was more like a fake investigation was uh, closed. Um, the policemen are still doing their uh, job at the, at the uh, Bosnian border. Um, but uh, today we filed this complaint and hopefully at some point um, in the future uh, this policy of denial that uh, the um, Croatian government is playing, but that we also know from, from Greece in a similar style, uh, will come to an end. And I think it's, uh, this is maybe the last sentence, I think uh, the conclusion or the starting point in 2013, and this uh, goes back to what, what uh, um, you just said, uh, was that the scandalization, the public reporting, is of course extremely important, as important as uh, activism from people like No Name Kitchen, uh, Border Violence Monitoring Network, um, Alarm Phone, uh, to uh, support people on the move, but also to document what is going on in a very detailed uh, way. And if you want to learn more, then there's this huge report from BBMN, the so-called Black Book, uh, uh, that covered, I don't know, some 800 uh, pushbacks uh, in a very detailed manner. But this didn't, uh, this was apparently not enough to change the situation significantly. Uh, and uh, this is why we thought that legal activities, uh, um, legal interventions in line with these other activities are necessary. And I would also say as a kind of positive, um, uh, very last sentence, <laughs> that uh, in, in, in Croatia maybe is an example uh, at the moment uh, for uh, a situation where it worked with exactly this combination because there's also a very, very important uh, court case before uh, the European Court of Human Rights from uh, t um, last November um, 21 about a pushback by Croatian authorities in that case it was to Serbia and it was the first time that this policy of denial got some, um, uh, this, uh, got a little bit um, attacked um, by by lawyers and uh, CMS, who is the NGO that we also heard in the play behind that case. And I think this is some is encouraging for us. And I think this is how we need to move uh, um, on with the journalists like the call and activists. And I think together, we will um, bring this policy to an end. <laughs> decisions from the courts and committees that can then be used together with the journalistic do documentation and political pressure and of course also the important work of activists. So Kashev, uh, it would be great if you could tell us a bit more about the activist side around against pushbacks and also speak more broadly about pushbacks all over the European Union and migration policies and the research that you do on that. So yeah, I will activate the activist mood. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I believe all of you are activists, like really. Uh, for for me, yes, the activism and the grassroots movements and the people themselves who will do the change, because this practice is happening in the Balkan now for years, more than a decade at least, and it grabbed the attention in 2013 and the legal process uh, is long and the politics as we saw is a game like as we heard and 
and all like really all completed each other doing the work together what I want to say really the states here the EU the Frontex all of them are really strong organized structured and got high resources and good tracks uh, and this is like their mission this is how they do all the time and it's it's establishing plan what we are seeing actually happening in Balkan what you are saying about the practice is the same thing that I was documenting 10 years ago in Egypt when Sudanese coming from south going to Sinai and also there was a slavery beating up people like shooting in the desert and it's the same practice uh, and it, it's happening funded by the EU like so in the, in the beginning that structured the Schengen area and this is the important because we are living in this uh, world of states and priorities and interest and the EU dealing as one state we don't want to forget that because when we are in the Schengen area have a kind of freedom of movement we are not a pattern or like in a piece inside the big bubble and that's why they are externalizing the European border not just to the non-EU countries in Balkan, but also to the center of Africa. Mediterranean Sea nowadays became like really a big grave. Like people are dying every day, pushing back happening every day. Uh, after the pushback, the next step is pullback. When you actually hire someone by proxy, train them, equip them, give it them like, okay, do it. And they are doing it and bringing people again to, to Libya, and Libya became a kind of uh, the shit hole uh, for, uh, for, for Europe, a uh, big slavery market in uh, 2022. It's crazy, it's really going crazy. And um, I'm, I'm happy because of this positivity, because actually I was coming uh, with black, uh, because I just, uh, yeah, like d d done something, like done a report and see how much money EU expending and spending every year in weapon trade just to securitize the border. And, and it's, it's really crazy and depressing to see how a Polish, like Frontex itself, uh, I was saying a Polish Frontex, sorry, it will come later. <laughs> Yeah, the Frontex itself, actually, this is the agency who is responsible for this violations. And then they judge themselves and yeah, everything is okay. At first time to see an agency, and correct me if I'm wrong, to do like international agreements with countries, with non-EU countries, they are not just responsible for the agreements between the, the EU member states, no, non-EU countries, and it, it's going deeper. Now they are uh, actually approved the agreement with North Macedonia uh, to expand the Frontex um, uh, mission zone or like zone of mission. So their mission or like zone of operation is around the border, like in the border zone. And now they are asking to expand it, to enlarge it already approved in North Macedonia and there's the still talks and agreements like going on with other four Balkan countries, Bosnia, Serbia, Montenegro and Albania. And this is crazy now, like it's not just to secure the border, now to expand. Frontex involved in Africa with Egypt, uh, maybe you heard about Egypt because the attention nowadays was all what happening, thank you. Um, they are involved in training 32 different African nationalities, border police, in the police academy of in Cairo, like Egyptian police academy in Cairo. And deaths are responsible actually, not just for violation, for murder, torture to death, surveillance. It, it's really going crazy. And we see all that the money is spending on, on Frontex. So when I talk about the, 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 like the, the European migration policy, it's rather also to tackle the, tackle the Frontex uh, involvement and, uh, and practice in, in, in all over. Like it, it's really going 
crazy. And for the activism, and because we are believing story taking a long, long time, but yeah, just... And that's what activists do. They are talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so what happened um, last year, different organizations, different uh, political groups from the, from the resistance movement became and established something like called a Polish Frontex. Not to reform it. No, it shouldn't be exist. Like they and, and yeah, all this militarization go and bring in officers. Like it's really crazy. They are building like a parallel state. I will stop here. Well, thanks. For <laughs> thanks for talking a lot, because this is a obviously a very important aspect that the border is not just at the border itself, but also goes way beyond the European border and also inside the European Union. And uh, of course, activists do more than talking and very important interventions. On the note of interventions, we also wanted to open to the audience if uh, you have questions or comments. It's already quite late but uh, at least we wanted to open the possibility if there are <laughs> questions and comments from the audience, yeah? Um, yes, please. I was just wondering, and maybe um, you can answer that, what happened to the uh, ombudswoman in um, <laughs> Russia? And is she still in place or, yeah, well, figures, but still maybe you can go into details. And what happened? Maybe even, Carson, do you know a bit more about the history of the Ombudswoman? I mean, I know that the one that received this letter that was really um, uh, also going to these police stations trying to access, the, like this scene is really happened. She wanted to go and access the computers, which is within her field of work, what she's uh, meant to do. And they were saying, like, we forgot the password. And the, yeah, so, um, I would say two years ago, she, they had a change. I know that um, she's still sort of um, active, uh, um, doing some work, but she, but um, I think there was a lot of pressure, and she really received death, death threats, and uh, like this is this is not uh, made up. It, it, it's true. Do you know a bit more why why she? If it was, I'm not even 100% sure if they have five year terms and you know she didn't apply for it anymore. Like, I, I would imagine if someone knows it, I'm sure. Yeah. She's followed by um, her former mm -hmm. vice um, yeah. ombudswoman, um, and uh, she is also doing as far as um, um, I know a um, very great job. So, um, it has um, to me the, I get the impression that this attempt of intimidation uh, was not successful. And, in, and maybe in that regard, it's also important to know that there was a very important investigation, or there are constant important investigations on the European level by an institution um, uh, called CPT. Um, and uh, uh, you can speak about that, who also who are allowed to um, visit, for example, police stations and uh, receive uh, immediate information on how many people um, are registered here, how many people were in prison cells, what are the conditions, and so on and so forth. And they, play, they tried to play the CPT um, on the Council of Europe uh, um, uh, level in a similar way as with the ombudsperson and completely failed. So this was a huge um, defeat of the Croatian policy that at some point, by a mistake of their own people, a report that they wanted to hide um, from the public became public that revealed a lot of um, uh, what the Croatian government usually tries to deny um, in, its, in its public statement. So, you want to learn more about this, it's uh, 
very readable. It's even not so dry as other legal documents sometimes are. And it's, it's really important because it uh, discovers the whole situation. And it also gives some um, idea of the number of pushbacks that, that uh, because this is also something people often ask, so what are the numbers? And since there is no official registration, it's difficult to say or to estimate how many people suffer from these pushbacks. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, the estimation is that there are at least uh, more than 30,000 per year. So they were able to, um, to uh, see the files uh, for a, a period of 18 days, 18 working days and were able to kind of conclude that in these 18 days, more than 2,200 uh, pushbacks were uh, executed, conducted by these um, border forces. So and if you then uh, calculate uh, what this means, uh, um, you come to a number of 30 to 40,000 uh, pushbacks per year only on the creation uh, forces. I think they even found some like notebooks, like Barbie, they had the cover of a Barbie um, cover, like the ones you buy in uh, Rive or so, where they wrote these things down by hand, and, and this is how they, how they got these numbers together. The funny um, small part of it is that it was this, the mistake that was done that uh, enabled this, uh, the CPT uh, is uh, the word for uh, committee uh, to prevent the torture. Um, was a mistake that was done by this Theresia, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, she published an email that she shouldn't have published, and then, uh, so it's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, did you want to follow up with that, or did you... No, yeah, it's, uh, I Theresia... I saw you the Yeah, <laughs> Theresia is a sad joke, actually. Um, but um, I just wanted to say that basically they, they started a smear campaign against the Committee for the Prevention of Torture of the Council of Europe, which is also some, like, it's really weird, it's like the Committee for the Prevention of Torture of the Council of Europe, and they try to say that they are some kind of activists, and they say the Germans are Schädlinge from the government, they are Schädlinge. Um, which are basically doing activism and um, what I also wanted to say is that Theresa, for example, when I met her and t tried to talk about pushbacks, she said, yeah, yeah, there are these stories coming up, but actually it's just a smear campaign against Croatia led by one guy, and I will not tell you the name, but it's a very rich guy, so it's basically, um, basically just um, the Big you behind all everything and um, try to influence the world stuff. So, but that's actually the Secretary of State and the Interior Ministry of Croatia. So, it's just um, I don't know. In the preparation, um, you had the question, what I think about her. I, I think it somehow says that we have to understand that um, also in democracies, there can't be people elected who are just bunch of liars committing crimes in the end and that's somehow um, yeah sad but to live in a democracy also gives you somehow the freedom to vote for someone else and that creates some space to maneuver hopefully also in Croatia at some point but yeah that's um, it's that point where we are in, in the European Union as so, so all the others said <laughs> I did not want to talk so much. And grab drinks now. Like, uh, what, what do we do? Thanks. Ah, yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Um, um, where to start? Uh, so, they're doing good at the moment, these ones, because since we published this video, uh, the pushbacks at this area went down a lot because it's a very, let's say, wide open area. It's an area where you can film super easily. So I think that the, it, it really, like that it's, it, it became quiet. So um, good for them. But maybe I can say two or three sentences about that because it was like really a, a touching encounter. It's a very remote area, as you can imagine. And um, they, they literally live in one of their like three, four houses that use, let's say you get pushed back at this very river spot that they used to use a lot. When you search for a light or for a house, you end up in their garden, literally, it's the first place. 
And um, I think for two years, sometimes every night, they had bloody people in their garden. And they are alone there. And their children are working in Slovenia and in Germany, as, as, as it is very often the case. They're in their mid-60s. They went through the war, and um, especially she is heavily traumatized. Um, and, and the whole thing, imagine you, you went through a war, and then in the depth of the night you hear screams because you, someone gets tortured. Like, I mean, it's like insanely hard for the one that gets tortured, but also to live through that every day. Um, and, and I think that's really what triggered a big part of my anger, to, to that we, ha we are safe here and we don't, you know, like this thing of keeping people out is also on the, on the shoulders of others, of a country that is a fragmented state, like Bosnia is the poorest country that we have in Europe, more or less. And then it's the region that is the poorest of this country. And there you just like, uh, I don't know, uh, you drop people that are already tortured and, and uh, wounded and without, in, in wet clothes in winter, that's something that they really loved to do, taking them off the shoes when there's snow. Um, and and, and uh, there are these people who, I don't know, live off with a job that they earn like 200 euros a month. And so they were like, and still they were sort of carrying that, and and I, and I remember that then uh, the, the the husband um, he showed me his garage, and it was really nicely tidy, cleaned up. He had the old uh, the old um, uh, what's it called uh, like the wardrobe that they they have a new one now in the in the in the living room, uh, and it was neatly. Uh, you had one shelf for each part of clothes, so he collected in the village. Wherever he could, wherever he was able, he collected clothes. Everyone knew that the good people. So he had them there. Then he had another wardrobe full of canned food, and then he had a place where he could cook coffee. He had a place where he had the food. So he was like completely prepared for for every night because they were alone. No one came in the beginning. They tried to call the Bosnian police because if you find illegal people in your country, then the one that is responsible is the police. And they were just like, yeah, grandma, just uh, go back to sleep, close your door. Um, and um, yeah, but it was heavy, it was really heavy. And, and uh, for them it's over now, quite, for quite some time. But there are others now who carry, like they just changed the spot, you know, like now but, it's other but, people. Sorry yeah, to please. interrupt you, but actually, when you said legal people and call the police, this is this this is like the shit we are living now. Mm -hmm. Because actually, when you find people mm -hmm. in help, you just like they are doing now the right thing. Because to call the police, hey, there are some people here without document, like illegalized. How like this is the crazy shit of new day system that we are living in, like to illegalize people and human beings. This is crazy, like really, what you are telling about the, the Bosnian-Croatian uh, border, it's happening nowadays like in the german uh, chicken border. Like every night people are coming because now there is an open route to Albania and they go through now, by the way. There is a lot of corruption involved, everyone is using like what's happening in Ukraine. And people ended up in, in Germany and then they push back from Germany by the Pontesal police to Czech Republic, and Czech Republic take the mission to torture people, to beat them up, to detain them, and then to deport them back, even to deport them back to Albania or Serbia, because they came from the shared border. And by the way, uh, this, is, th this is something like also positive or optimistic. In every place there is normal people, human beings. We call it like solidarity. This is the solidarity ground, really. People just see what's happening. It's wrong. They don't agree. And they are just trying to do whatever. Uh, what, what I want to raise, actually, uh, from an activist perspective, you have to activate yourself, too, to educate yourself. Because this is your responsibility. Yeah? You vote for these people. We are living in a democratic country. This country, one of the big sponsor for Frontex and for the border security happening. The border engineer, the border regime engineer is German. Huh? 
Germany really pushing further and for, further for this. So ask yourself, what, what, how could I hold my res uh, responsibility? Not just what's my responsibility. It's no, you have a responsibility. Educate yourself, talk with your circles, discuss this issue. Huh? Because really, really, all the shaky policies coming from a, just the European politician, when we say, like, it's a migration crisis, it's a refugee crisis, no, it's a political crisis. The problem is here, it started here. The, the, we, we say, like, the colonialism, no, actually, the exclusion of Africa happened in that. And we have, like, fear of, oh, all the African coming here, all these black people, not just the Eastern European. This is a kind of internal racism between white people. But no, actually, uh, science said that 80% of the African micro, uh, migration is inside the continent, the African continent. Just 20% who try to go out. And this is all because actually what's happening, like, hey, let's, let's buy, buy a paper and pen, see what the resources here and what's really happening here. And all this profit and money, like just Germany between night and day, decided to raise the, the military expenditure to 100 billion euro. And this is crazy. We were just like this guy, like, just, you have the money. You can entirely build a, a two start, like two lands out of nowhere to welcome the people, and you will get benefit because these people. Well educated, they work, you, you can make money out of them, you get taxes. Like it uh, should be a win win game, but what happened really is no sense. Really. And I, like, big, big respect, like, really big respect for the lawyers who can steal. I, I, I'm a lawyer, by the way, but I'm fed up. Man, <laughs> really, I'm fed up. Like, come on, we, we are the one who make the rules and the, the legal policies and the, the, we say policy makers, so the makers who should help and change. But this is not happening because it's all a game. It's, it's all kind of a show. What's happening now in Italy was that uh, we are taking so long and we could want to drink something. And thank you, I will stop here and not discussing more political issue happening in, in Europe. Yeah. Coast Guard and yeah. training. So, okay, but the um, reality is that there is no bilateral deal between the German government and the Libyan government. I don't know. Um, but <coughs> what it is is that the European Commission is supporting the Libyans um, and the Coast Guard and their trainings, and then there are some bilateral deals, for example, between Malta and Libya and um, Italy and Libya, but there is no bilateral deal, um, like no direct money flow from Germany to Libya. Nevertheless, there is 25% um, of the European Union budget um, kind of like supporting. Uh, like, 25% of the European Union budget is spent by Germany, and they, like the European Commission, in the end supporting the Libyan Coast Guard. But what um, actually this government did, and that is that in two mandates, um, like military mandate, Irini, for example, um, the um, training for the Libyan Coast Guard is excluded now. So there's no, also no like support um, when it comes to training from the German government, and like. Would not say that's perfect, but there is no deal between Germany and Libya. And uh, actually, yesterday, um, um, the German government 
some after some discussions internally <laughs> and now um, supports actually civil search and rescue missions in the central Mediterranean of this like hundreds of millions so they, they took the decision first time first country in the European Union to support um, and you don't have to clap but it's um, <laughs> yeah generally like SOS Mediterranean uh, SOS humanity yes yeah, awesome. um, no but, but that's somehow also I, I think not not something to, to be in favor of or to love the German government, but I think it's an important step that some of the European governments also like take a decision that they like spend more money on, and that's the case, that the German gov government directly spends more money on um, civil search and rescue missions now um, than on the Libyan government. But we can talk when we have another drink. But you, you can also... <laughs> okay, can I say one thing? Because I would like to take this up and, and, and what, what strikes me, but also when I was preparing for today, is for example the fact and that I learned um, that Germany is still uh, supporting these missions uh, in Croatia um, um, by cars and by uh, by, uh, yeah, night by, yeah. by night goggles uh, to, to spot the people. Um, and uh, as it uh, was the case in the pre with the previous government um, under under uh, Mr. Seehofer. And we have the same problem that we learned about today in Croatia and Bulgaria, maybe at the moment even worse than in Croatia from, from what we hear. And uh, even there we have German policemen, German cars and, the, and uh, German equipment supporting uh, the Bulgarian border police in their brutal pushback policy. Uh, and I think this is, uh, and we can conti would, could, could continue uh, um, with other things. And I think this is something that is really concerning, that is um, not uh, well covered, at, or at least I uh, um, didn't know this until, uh, until today. Um, and uh, something where it is necessary, and Eric is not in charge here, so he can be relaxed. Uh, but, uh, no, but I think that it is something uh, where we, as uh, here in Berlin, uh, need to put our uh, finger on and say this is uh, yeah. not, uh, not uh, acceptable. Just okay. one thing, because of Libya and Central Mediterranean, <laughs> because the German are investing in the search and rescue, they are the one behind funding the Egyptian Coast Guard with 80 million equipments for search and rescue. And when we, or like the Egyptians, huh? search and rescue people, they will not bring them to a safe harbor, but they will bring them to Egypt. And yes, so this is actually like, this is the hell everywhere. And you know what actually happened in like, what happened in Melilla a couple of months ago. Border security are crazy. I was going to ask a closing questions on where to exert the pressure, like where the pushbacks happen, or where the money comes from, or you know, in the courts, or where the political decisions are made. But you already addressed that, yeah. <laughs> so I have one little point of activation left, which is that there's actually a very long waiting list for this play, and so the group behind it uh, wants to stage it again uh, sometime soon in the coming month. However, there's not enough funding yet. So if anyone here in this room <laughs> is interested or knows potential sources of funding, do approach the production so that uh, yeah, this play can continue to be shown and generate discussion and resistance. <laughs>